And you can all see my screen, right? We can see your screen, yeah. Cool. <clears throat> so welcome, everyone. So we have a small group now. I think there'll be people joining as we go. Um, we just started the New Weeks Challenge, and so I think everyone's busy meeting and planning and um, doing exciting things. So today we have Brenda Penante. Is that correct? Brenda Penante from Perfect. Recife. Yes. Now living in Berlin. And um, Yavabel and I both met Brenda all in South Africa. So it's a bit of an international connection where she was tutoring. Um, and so Brenda is a data scientist working for Wayfair, which she just explained for those of you who joined on time. And I believe she specializes in fraud prevention, but she'll tell you more about that. So Brenda is originally from Brazil and studied uh, astrophysics and or theoretical physics and string theory. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from an interview that she did where um, she said that growing up, she never imagined studying physics, but um, inspired by her father. It was her father that had inspired her to go on and uh, look at the stars and then go on to study physics, building on her love of mathematics. And according to the internet, which must be true, um, due to books that were available in your house, perhaps inspired by your father. Um, yeah, and so Brenda has been extremely enthusiastic and supportive um, about, about Ted Academy and the work that we're doing and is uh, planning to see if she can help design one of the challenges together with her colleagues. Um, but having switched from a physics background, working at CERN, where uh, CERN, I guess everyone knows what CERN is, but if you don't, it's this place where there's some of the largest experiments or large ex largest physics exper experiments in the world are happening. Um, from CERN to Wayfair and now to us. So yeah, hand it over to you to talk about from how to discover some of the building blocks of physics to how to figure out when people are trying to scam, uh, scam purchase uh, furniture online. So thanks, Brenda, over to you. Thank you very much, Aaron. Yeah, so I'm also really excited to meet this batch. I heard a lot about, about Ten Academy and this batch. I heard really good things, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to talk. Uh, it's going to be a little bit of a high-level overview about the business problems we're trying to tackle. And I'll try to also share some useful things that I found when um, getting a job in data science, what I found in this industry, and what, what might be useful for um, aspiring people aspiring to join this industry. Um, so, let me... Yeah, I already talked a little bit about my particular career path. Um, I grew up in Brazil and I studied physics there. And I followed the academic path in physics for quite some time. I did a master's in Canada. And then uh, I went to Ames, which some of you might know in South Africa for a few months where I was a tutor there, um, and then I went to London uh, and to Geneva to start to still do research in physics. And it was almost exactly two years ago when I decided to switch to data science. And this was my first job at Wayfair, which is where I still am. And I'm, I live in Berlin now, um, working in fraud detection. So by the way, I want this talk to be interactive. So any any point, just talk or write on the chat, no problem. So Wayfair, as I was already mentioning before, is an e-commerce company. And what is e-commerce? E-commerce is basically replacing physical stores by virtual stores, uh, where probably most of us grew up going to physical shops to buy things. But now, where the internet and smartphones and computers are becoming so powerful and everywhere, uh, there is a big trend to move to the internet space. Uh, so basically, uh, tons of industries are now pretty, some of them existing exclusively on the internet. Um, so some examples here. Amazon is the biggest one. American companies started just selling books, but now sells pretty much everything. Um, Alibaba is one of them in China. Um, maybe some of you know Jumia. Is that that's how I pronounce probably Jumia? Uh, that also sells and everything from clothes to groceries, 
uh, is a vast catalog of things, and Wayfair is one of them. Um, Wayfair is American, it's present in a handful of countries, and it's specialized on home and decoration, um, decoration beds, couches, etc. But uh, e-commerce can also be uh, not necessarily to sell a particular product. They can also do such services. So Airbnb is one of them where you can book uh, places for short stays, for holiday, Uber for ride sharing, like a taxi thing, uh, and also to transfer funds. For instance, uh, Wise, the form of TransferWise, uh, PayPal, etc. And they can work selling things to customers or they can sell their services to other companies. Um, there are even cases where you as a person can go and sell your stuff there to other people. So there is basically no business involved. Um, so e-commerce was already getting pretty popular uh, even before last year, but the pandemic just catapulted the industry to uh, the next level. Uh, in this chart on the left, you can see that's in the USA. Uh, the growth of e-commerce compared to just normal retail over the years. And this blue curve here shows that normal retail has been growing around 5% no, more or less each year. But e-commerce uh, was already growing a lot more, around 15%. And in 2020, it just went to 45. Um, this is a huge, huge industry, not just in the USA, also globally. It's already an industry that um, is multi-trillion dollars and you can imagine that during the pandemic um, many companies were forced unfortunately to close their doors and they in order to keep existing they had to move on online um, maybe some people just didn't uh, they you know lost their jobs had to start something and the internet was the place to do that maybe some customers who were initially uh, reluctant to buy things online they didn't have an option because the shop was closed. So you have to move to the online space. But then uh, once you go there, you realize that there are certain conveniences. It might, might be easier. So this trend will very likely continue. And now companies are moving towards, there's a trend to move towards remote work. And e-commerce is particularly suited for that because you don't have necessarily a physical shop. Um, and once you're over the internet, you and your all your transactions flow through the internet, you have data, a lot more data than a physical shop, which uh, makes it a particularly good place to for data scientists. So types of data that uh, flow through the e-commerce industry is clickstream data. So anything, your browsing history on your phone or in your laptop, um, the payments that you make credit card, PayPal, et cetera. Um, your shopping behavior gets stored. What items have you bought in the past? What items people who are close to you have bought in the past? Um, the products that you sell, what, uh, what are these products? What is the color, the size, information like that? Uh, if you have a social media presence, you can also store how people are interacting with you over social media. Um, you can scrape data from your competitors to uh, compare how you as a company are doing compared to your competitors. And also, if you're selling physical products, you can have data about the uh, production, where, when the item was produced, when it was shipped, to which warehouse, when it was delivered, all of that. And once you have all this data and probably a bunch of other things that you can think of, uh, you can ask very specific questions which have to do with data science. So one of the first things that I was talking a little bit before we started was uh, recommender engines. When you sell so many products, it's, it would be silly to show the same landing page to me and to Aaron and to Yababel and to one of you because we might have different interests. So if a company wants to sell more, they would tailor this to your in particular interests. So having a good recommendation engine is very useful. Um, if you might want to adjust your prices compared to uh, what your competitors are doing, or should I, should I put a discount on this item? Uh, so 
The pricing can be dynamic as well. Um, you can do time series forecasting based on um, the, the past selling behavior. You might want to predict how many, or how many sales will I do next week or next month? And you can adjust uh, your supply chain based on that. Like how many trucks should I book to deliver these items? How much space I need in the warehouse? Certain questions like this. Um, you can do personalized marketing. So maybe if I receive an email saying, hey, have a look on this website, I might want to, I might respond more to certain types of content than you might. So this is another area. Advertising. Uh, it happens a lot that if you search something on Google, you get ads from companies. These ads are bought by this company. And the company might want to choose which particular search keywords at Google do I want to buy? Which ones are the best that will bring more people to my website? Uh, this is another important question. You can do analysis on reviews. Uh, if a lot of people buy an item and they rate your products, uh, you might want to get an idea of what are generally my customers saying. How can I surface the best and the most informative reviews to, to, the, to, to, to new visitors, etc. And lastly, I want to mention fraud detection. Once you are in the online space, you are exposed to a lot of malicious people just trying to take advantage of your business. As e-commerce grows, so does fraud. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about to you today. Brenda, can I just jump in for a second yeah. and just, um, I just want to see if anyone in the group, I know, I know it's a lot of information, so I think the majority of um, our trainees Maybe I can ask, how many people have ever bought anything online? You can raise your hand. You can raise your virtual hand, yeah. OK. So we have a couple of people. So maybe we can ask uh, somebody, maybe not now, or Abraham, to explain what, what you bought online and from who. So, Brenda, the reason I wanted to ask is I think the, the familiarity with uh, most people and all of the details that you're providing is uh, people may not be so familiar with online shopping. Fortunately. Oh. fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so, Natnail, do you want to just tell us what you bought online or Abram? Abram? Someone else who's bought something online? Kevin, I see you had raised your hand. Kevin? Um, so for me, uh, I bought my current laptop um, online way back when. And after that, I've made a couple of multiple purchases as well. Um, In, off a Kenyan marketplace? Um, no, no. Um, some from the Kenyan marketplace, others from abroad, others from AliExpress and one from Amazon. Uh, but my experience with shopping from Kenya hasn't been really good. Um, I once bought an item that when I, it came into my hands and I was using it, I realized it was um, fake. I mean, it was a counterfeit product. So. Okay. Sorry, I didn't hear Kevin. What did you buy? Um, uh, a laptop um, from Amazon, Raspberry Pi from AliExpress, and a gamepad controller from Jumia. And the what about from Jumia was a counterfeit product. Oh no, so you have uh, experience with fraud already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But luckily enough, um, I returned it and they were, they were generous enough to refund me my money and they went and bought a an, an, an original one, one that wasn't counterfeit at an actual store. Okay, that's that's good to hear that you solved your problem. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Are there any other questions? Is there any are any of these terms unfamiliar? Does somebody want to ask a question? I think Steshi has a question. Uh, yeah. Okay. So in Kenya we have Jumia, and then we have uh, some guys who do this through social media. They'll just open a page and then you can you can request and then they deliver to you directly. 
is that also a part of uh, this e-commerce? Yes, yeah, so yeah, exactly. Ordered online and then they deliver to your house. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And what did you buy? Uh, I basically buy everything online. I buy my electronics online. I buy bed sheets online. Uh, basically everything. <laughs> Good. How do you find it? Do you find it? Why do you buy online? Do you find it just easier? Uh, yeah, I buy online because uh, it's hectic going around the city trying to find things. And it's just easier to look online, see if you like something. And uh, my experience hasn't been so bad. I had a bad experience with Jumia, but uh, uh, for the ones who are just on Instagram and they post things, it's basically been quite okay. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Anyone else? Hey. Hey. Hello, how are you? Uh, hello, Arun. Uh, my phone, my my mic was not working. I changed the device previously. Yeah. Okay, my experience, uh, uh, I'm just starting uh, last year buying online. Uh, my current phone, uh, I bought about uh, from online, from local market. Uh, and uh, I think I'm also buying uh airport uh, from amazon but some uh, somebody or uh, another person paid for me but i saw it and i liked it uh, i bought uh, that this is my experience oh thank you all right cool should i carry on then aaron yeah please yeah cool so once you have so we now have you know people buying online and then you also have people with bad intentions going to your website and doing illegal things one type of fraud uh is the what arun already mentioned scamming so these are people just trying to take advantage of your business so let's say they order um let's say they order a computer and then they just afterwards call your business and say, I didn't receive it. Or I say it was broken and they never prove it. Or the company asks, maybe you return that and then I'll refund it and just send a box full of bricks. So this kind of thing happen. And it happens consistently that some people are just trying to take advantage of you. Of you. And for the company, this, this uh, results in financial loss. Uh, so this is... So the question is now how to separate these customers that are trying to scam you from the customers who are just really unlucky. They just have lots of bad experiences. This is one issue. There is another one which is called payment fraud, which is um, somebody opens an account and orders something, but actually they're using a stolen credit card. Um, so for a company, you would like to be able to prevent these orders before they're placed, to protect your customers, to protect uh, your business reputation, and to just also not lose the money. Because in the end, when a company sells, uh, uh, sells a, a product to a stolen card, the person will ask for a refund, and then the, cost, the company needs to pay for that. Um, Another one is called account takeover, which means that uh, someone got hold of your account credentials, your user ID, your password, and they they log into your account and they just buy uh, something using your stored payment method. So this is also uh, a problem. Um, and there are, there are lots of types of fraud. There are other types of fraud, for example, Somebody might pretend to be your website, but actually it's a fake website. Uh, Kevin got a counterfeit product. This is also uh, like a fake, fake suppliers, fake products there. Uh, you might have people putting fake reviews there uh, to, I don't know, to make an item seem better than it is. Lots of fraud types to consider. 
Um, and one, the one that I work with specifically, it's payment fraud. So the one that people are trying to use stolen cards. Um, so from a co at the company side, all you get to know is that a customer calls you complaining, hey, I didn't place this order. This order was placed by someone else. Uh, or why did I get, why didn't my credit card get charged? I didn't do that. And then the company needs to pay this back. Uh, the term for that is called a chargeback. And then, uh, so what you want to do as a business, you want to be able to block those and prevent those from happening even before the order gets uh, confirmed and shipped. And why is this a good use of machine learning? It's because the trends are changing all the time. Uh, people are always trying to beat the system uh, and try, there are always new patterns that is very difficult for a human to know uh, and if you use machine learning, you can adapt to changing patterns over time. Uh, is there any questions so far? Okay, so the ideal fraud detection system will act like this. So if you have uh, a good order, let's say you have, a, you have a machine learning classifier that will output something like one is fraud. Zero, not fraud. So uh, you want all your good orders, the legitimate orders, you want, you want them to be able to go through the system and to get to the customer. And you wanna be able to block all the fraudulent orders, the, yeah, the called the true positives. But sometimes they're gonna make mistakes. Every machine learning model makes mistakes. So, and sometimes they're gonna let through uh, fraudulent orders Sometimes they're gonna block good orders. And in, in both situations, um, in both situations, what you have is that you're gonna get customers that are unhappy, either because uh, the credit card got uh, used by, by a malicious actor and who stole their information, or because they were a good customer and your website just didn't let them buy. So this is really bad experience for the customer. Uh, it might uh, result in financial loss for your company and it will maybe impact your reputation as a company. So you always have this trade-off. Uh, if you wanna block all the fraudulent orders, you have to be careful because it might end up blocking also too many good orders. So this is called the false positive problem. Um, is that clear? Yeah, no, I think that's good. Yeah. Cool. So I want to just move on to, I'm just going to move on to sp some specific uh, issues in machine learning that arise from the particular fraud detection system, the fraud detection problem space. One is uh, class imbalance. If you imagine like you um, in your company, most of the orders are good. There is only actually a small percentage that are fraud. I put here 1%. Uh, there is some data that I found in Cargo with credit card. It was even less, it was around 0.2%. And if you just have so few samples, um, how can you ensure that you're actually capturing the behavior, the fraudulent behavior? Um, and some techniques that I used is when you're preparing your data, you might want to use resampling methods. So either you can uh, do undersampling or oversampling or a combination of both. So if you wanna use undersampling, in the end, you're just taking from your legitimate orders, you're actually taking a subset of those. Um, so in the end, you'll get a, a data set that, that is represented in both situations. Uh, but you might not want to do that if you don't have a lot of data, because otherwise you're just feeding less data to your training model. Uh, or you might want to just take the examples of the fraudulent cases and just take a bigger sample, so oversampling those. And there are a bunch of different techniques to do that. Um, I, I just linked here, if you maybe some of you have used them before, there's a package in um, sklearn called in Imblearn for imbalanced learning um, that has, that gives you a bunch of different ways to uh, resample your data set and 
what people typically do is that they will experiment with different different methods and evaluate in your evaluation set to see um, what which model has the best performance and just make sure to not resample your evaluation set because this one needs to re represent the real world where the proportions are really um, uh, the real ones without resampling. Any questions here? I'll move on to the is that, a reason, is that a reasonable fraud rate, 0 0.2%? Is that? So this is, yeah, I think in the in the industry it would be something, um, I need to also not disclose like no, information. No, of course no, not, it, it, it would the, be also something, yeah, that's reasonable, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, and another one, if you're dealing with a very imbalanced data set, uh, you need to choose the right metric to evaluate your model. Uh, for instance, a, a typical evaluation metric that people use, the accuracy is just simply not suited for this case, because if you have not, you know, let's say 99% of uh, orders being not fraud, you can simply just have a model that predicts not fraud all the time, and then your accuracy will still be really high, but actually your model is not picking up any fraud. Uh, so in this situation, it's very useful to look at the confusion matrix, which is here, uh, where you actually plot the numbers of uh, here at the top here the all the number of fraud orders that you that you manage to find, but also you want to be able to find what are the true orders that are fraud and your model managed to find. And if this number is here zero, then your model is not doing a very good job. Um, and so certain other metrics, for instance, precision and recall are very good. Whoops. Um, where precision, you, you, if you look here at this diagram, the precision is uh, out of all the orders that you are predicting to be fraud, the true positives. Um, how many of the how many of the orders that you're predicting to be positive are actually fraud? So if your precision is high, it means your decision is actually uh, you're quite good at making a prediction, but you might be missing out on a bunch of fraudulent cases that you, your model wasn't able to pick up. Um, or if you look at recall, you're actually looking at it of all the fraudulent orders how many did I manage to find? So you basically, higher recall, you're making this circle bigger and bigger. Uh, but the problem there is that the precision will go down. You end up uh, having too many false positives. So you need to find the right balance for that. Um, and also another way is the area under this receiver operating characteristic curve. Uh, there are more I uh, just uh, linked to more resources here. Is that clear? This is... Uh, one topic that I always get them soft around, and I always have to look them up. I assume, I assume most of this is new to most of our trainees. Um, Stashi has a question. Yeah? Stashi? Uh, yeah, I wanted to ask about resampling. I want to change it. To the resampling one? Has it changed the distribution of your training set? Yeah. And how that influences? I think you're breaking a little bit, Stashi. Uh, maybe you can write. I don't know. Yeah. Or, or I, I could hear you now. You can try again. Uh, I was asking if uh, yeah. resampling changes the distribution of the training set and how that affects your your predictions yeah exactly so, that would mean your training set has a different distribution exactly so you, this is a really good question because you are artificially changing the distribution of your training set but you're doing this to help your model find the patterns but it's very 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 important that you do not resample the evaluation set the evaluation set, the test set, needs to have the distribution in the real world. So you're just changing the way you're training your model, but you're trying to achieve something that performs well, 
in the not resampled data sets that has the same distribution as uh, when you're trying to do the real predictions for um, in the re in real life. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Uh, this one, I know it's a lot of information. If anybody wants to ask a question here as well, or I can actually go over it again if you prefer. Yes, everyone can type. If they have any questions, feel free to use the chat box. Which of the resampling method is advised? Undersampling and oversampling. Right, so um, if you see here, this undersample, you're ca kind of getting, uh, you're reducing the size of your data set. So you're having, uh, actually, if you have a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of data, this might be a good thing to start because um, it's, it's probably quicker as well to train with less data. However, if you don't have a lot of data, then you don't want to you don't want to waste any any sample that you have. So uh, in that case, oversampling might be a better a better idea. But you can treat this as some kind of hyperparameter as well. Like um, you can ideally, depending on your situation, you can try try different methods. That's what I would do, and then see uh, what performs best in your evaluation set. Make sense? Cool. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll just move on to some other additional problems that you, we have in fraud. I know that in the week zero of the of the batch training, you you've encountered this issue of concept drift, where the distribution of the data just naturally changes with time as the let's say the customers are changing their behavior, or for instance, with COVID, people change their behavior and then your data distribution just naturally changes. In fraud, you have yet another child challenge, which is called adversarial drift, which is people just actively trying to beat your system. So just to give you an example, let's say uh, there is a fraudulent attack coming from some IP address in a particular case. And people, some people in your company identify this, uh, this attack, so it now block these orders. What the fraudsters would do, they would just start attacking you in a different way, and you don't know that. So they are actively trying to beat the system. So this is a really big challenge uh, in fraud. Just, you have to always be up to date with what are the, what's the new thing that the, the fraudsters are trying to do. Um, Another one is called label delay. You know, if you're doing, if you're doing, uh, if you're trying to train a model in like supervised learning, you need to have labels. But in fraud, uh, if somebody uses my credit card to to buy something, I might not actually notice. I might not log in to go to my bank and see that somebody used my card for weeks, for uh, even sometimes months. So you don't get the real label, the, the, if it's fraud or not, immediately. You don't get that data immediately. So by then, imagine uh, there is a fraud attack happening, attacking a certain type kind of customers, and we don't know that. So we carry on just approving orders and letting these orders go through, and then one month later we realize they were all fraud. So this is a problem. Does that make sense? So um, I'll just put here some ways to deal with these issues. Um, one of them, the first one is to have anomaly alerts in your company. So even though you don't know yet if things are fraud or not, you might just get an alert if some data distributions is very, very unusual. So I'm just having here with the first one, if you're just getting lots of orders in a particular, let's say, address or neighborhood or from this IP, what's going on? So then people can go and investigate. Uh, which brings me to this second square, which is having humans and fraud investigators to 
do the, some detective work. Uh, don't rely just on the machine learning problem, on the machine learning model. Uh, have when you have an alert, just have people go and have a look and be able to manually take action to block orders, for instance. Um, if you want to, since the data distribution is always changing and people are trying to beat the system, you have this drift, it's really important to keep retraining your machine learning model frequently so that you can incorporate these trends as time goes. Uh, so you can release new, new models trained with more recent data as often as possible. Um, and the last thing here, which uh, is pretty difficult to address, is what's called network effect. Um, let's say we have some fraudulent fraudsters that are professional fraudsters attacking up one, one online shop. Then they go and they come to attack my company. I don't know that because I have no way of telling that these people have already acted and um, performed fraud somewhere else because I don't own that data. Uh, so in this case, it's very common for companies to actually uh, buy, buy data from third party vendors that work with several different companies and can provide you with some um, insight on whether or not this customer was already seen somewhere else performing fraud. Uh, so this uh, is normally addressed by just trying to get data from outside of your organization. Any questions? Is model drift similar to conf conf similar to concept drift? So I don't think I think they're the same thing. I don't know, maybe Yababel, I think they're the same thing, like... Um, I think very similar. Yeah. I don't, yeah. What is model drift? Is like the model uh, not performing so well, right? Exactly. Yeah, because it's trained on, on not up-to-date data. Yeah. So I think in the end, it's the same thing. Yeah, I, th I think they're all related, this data drift. Um, model drift, concept drift, it's just they apply it different um, for different parts uh, of the basically the ecosystem. And the cause is different. I think the attribution is different, why they change. Uh, one is because yeah, like the data is drifting because people are changing behavior. Uh, in this case, the behavior is like the is drifting because people are learning like from you, like from your actions. And in the model sense, the model is getting older. So the causes are different, but the actual concept is very similar, that there something is being performing or eroding, basically. Yeah, I think I can imagine uh, the model still being a good model, but just needing to be retrained with new data to capture new trends. But it might also be that, uh, that your model, it, it just becomes, um, non-performant with with some new trends that your model is simply not able anymore to capture the patterns i think that could also happen and then you maybe need to change hyperparameters or change something about your model it could also be just due to basically the model the algorithm is not yeah. the concept some of the assumptions in the algorithm is not anymore fulfilled yeah that, yeah Thank you. So the last thing I wanted to bring attention to you is that a typical fraud detection system in your company is not, it's well beyond just having a machine learning model. So you have this complicated diagram I'm gonna walk you through. Uh, but what I want to, that to be like the take home message is that your model is just a part of it. Uh, your model sits here, but there are other components that play a very important role. So, for example, uh, we already talked about having fraud investigators. So
So these are people who are um, experts in fraudulent behavior. They would just take certain examples and do like the detective work to find out whether or not maybe your model was wrong or um, maybe they received an alert from an alert system in your company and then they, they are trying to investigate whether or not this is actual fraud and whether or not we should take action. Um, oops. So we have here is an escalation system. So basically an alert that triggers every time there is uh, some unusual behavior in the data set. And this um, alert system might just um, tell people to, hey, have a look at these orders. They look dodgy. Um, they look dodgy, so have a look. And then finally, there is a final decision system that we need to take both input from your machine learning model, but also from the people, the investigators, to finally take an action on whether or not to block or to allow an order to go through. Um, so let me just walk you through a few different flows here. Um, this is what could be like the optimal automated flow. Uh, so you have here uh, first a customer, either a genuine customer or, or a fraudster, buying, interacting with your website, buying something, and that will generate data. The data go, gets stored in your uh, databases. This data and the label will come uh, to your machine learning model. Your machine learning model will say, yep, that's good, or oh, no, that's fraud. You go to the decision system. The decision system will finally say block the order or no, do not block the order. Finally, it gets to the to the um, to impact the customer. You know, the customer gets the order approved or not. So this is the um, ideal case when everything is automatic. Uh, but sometimes it's not the case like this. Uh, sometimes uh, what happens is, uh, let's say the customer will do the same thing, buy uh, something in your website, then the features and the labels go to the model. But then uh, in your decision system, even though your machine learning model decided something, this might hit some specific rules that were created by, um, by, a, by a fraud investigator. Do we have a hand? Anyone has a question? Yes, I have a question uh, regarding the label part. Yeah. Regarding the label part, is that is that automatic as well? Or the, there is like a human label in the data that is, we get from the features? Right. So, uh, yeah, right. There are two things here. Sorry, I think that might have been a bit confusing. You, did, you do have labels when you're training the model, but at this point, you're just trying to make a prediction. So you don't have the labels. Uh, but, but you can have uh, labels generated by, um, so this is what I'm getting to uh, right now, that sometimes even though you don't have labels, you might ask the fraud investigators to, um, to review the orders manually and then provide a label to you. So, and this will feed back into the model for retraining. But in the automated case, yes, maybe uh, I shouldn't have said you get labels. You just get the features, and then you get uh, the prediction from the model. OK, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so whoops. Yeah, yeah. So here, uh, what I was saying is that sometimes the fraud investigators might, by hand, pick up certain certain uh, patterns saying, oh, this item is being is suffering an attack last week. And they might put some rules in your decision system, which might be unseen from your machine learning model. So even though your model predicted something like this is not fraud, it might come here and still uh, your decision system needs to take into account that you have specific rules that uh, need to be, that probably you should block this order. So um, another use is that you can use the, even though you do not have labels at when you're predicting, uh, your fraud investigators might be able to give you labels. 
Um, and this is when I wait for you to address the label delay, like because you have to wait for the fraudsters for the fraud to be caught for you to get the real labels. And these labels can be used to um, to feed back into the model. This is uh, yeah. So this is called active learning. Uh, so there are many different flows you can have in this. This drive diagram is quite complex. I just wanted to uh, bring attention to certain parts of that. Um, and since you are also training for this batch, you're trying to be, you know, to be a spe specialist on ML ops. I wanted to bring attention that it's really important to to have a good pipeline to retrain and release models. Um, this is just a little block here in the diagram, but it's really, really important in, in fraud detection. Uh, you want to keep retraining and releasing new models, um, but at the same time, you want to make sure your models are are um, good models. They are not trained on, uh, let's say, bad data, that they are, the performance is good. Because if you imagine that you're all of a sudden automating the fraud detection without the proper safety checks, this could really be catastrophic. It could end up blocking lots of good orders or you could end up allowing lots of fraud orders and this would be really bad. So that's why every time you retrain is important to validate the model performance, uh, to monitor that, that you know everything is behaving as you'd expect. Uh, when you're doing predictions in real time, you might uh, want to make sure that uh, the values of your features are not so different from the ones that your model is trained in, uh, or you might want to, to make sure that you don't have a bug somewhere and all of a sudden you have like missing values or completely random values for a feature and making predictions that are unreliable. Uh, so this is really important as well. Um, this is all that I had in terms of content. Uh, I can just summarize now for you that the e-commerce industry is really growing. It's booming. There are lots of data science applications. Um, but then as it grows, of course, you also more uh, you also have loads more of fraud attacks. Uh, machine learning is, <clears throat> is very suited for that because it can adapt to changing behavior. And there are specific challenges when it comes to fraud detection, like delayed labels, the class imbalance, this adversarial drift, uh, and then there are other challenges as well. Um, and that if you want to work in a fraud detection particular area of a company, you need to also understand that there's a lot more than just a machine learning model. There's a whole department dedicated to that, uh, including people, including analysts, and a decision tool. So you need to collaborate with engineers, you need to collaborate with people, um, it's, it's a very, I would say, kind of complex domain. Um, it's, and it's important to have a, a pipeline that will retrain and validate your models uh, in a frequent basis. Yeah, there are some resources here. And finally, I just wanted to um, share some, some things that you, that you might expect if you end up like going to work in an e-commerce company. Um, there are it's a very kind of fast paced environment uh the data quality will not be as you would expect if you're using data from let's say online data sources or Kaggle you might find very noisy data kind of same information coming from different places ambiguity um documentation that is outdated so this is just how the real life is, you're going to spend a lot of time just diving into data to understand. Um, sometimes the business will move in the sense that uh, what was important last week is no longer important uh, next week. So you, you need to, uh, you might need to respond to things. So you might start working on something this week, but then you have to move to something else. So it's really important to be versatile. That's what I'm saying. Um, and it's also important to uh, not try to work on something perfect uh, and instead trying to make incremental incremental uh, improvements in whatever, whatever you're working on. And so you can get feedback from people quickly and you know if you move in the right direction. Um, so what I'm saying here, what's important to, to ask lots of questions, it's a lot better to ask questions from your colleagues 
than to spend lots of day to, days finding out afterwards that you were uh, working on a, a slightly like wrong question or answering the wrong question. So ask, ask away. And when you're talking to people, ask, ask yourself, are they technical people? Are they more uh, the, in the, on the business side? Uh, so they can adjust like the level of technicality when you're talking to them. Um, and feedback is really important. Ask for feedback and give feedback to others. And then you can continuously improve. Um, and yeah, never stop learning uh, and innovating. So th that's what I had to say. Thanks very much. Happy to have more of a chat and answer questions. So I think, I, thanks very much, Brenda. I think we still have a couple of minutes. We'll wrap up um, hopefully around 4 p.m. UTC, 6 p.m. Germany, but time for questions. Hi, Stashi. Uh, you can hear me? Yeah. OK, yeah, so I still have a question on the labels. So the labels? Yeah. Assuming you're working for a company that can't really afford these fraud investigators, and you have a data set, this data set does not have any labels on it. How do you go about getting those labels? Right. Um, so are you imagining a scenario where you wouldn't even have people to investigate those? Uh, yeah. This was a different data set, but still it was the zero one. Uh, right. Fraud or not fraud, but the data set did not have any labels, and uh, we needed to come up with the labels. Yeah. And uh, it didn't know how to go about it. Right. So, one thing that uh, it's actually used by many companies is to actually, instead of trying to do the whole detection yourself, so in order to do fraud detection yourself, you need quite a lot of data. Uh, but there are other companies that they are specialized in fraud detection only. So what you could do is I will pay for this service. I'll send them my data and they will give me uh, labels on whether or not they think this is fraud or not. And these other companies, uh, they don't work with just your data. Let's say they work with the data of my company, your company, uh, and a lot of other companies. So together, they get a very large data set with a lot of information. And they can do detection for you. And all you need to do is just to use um, whatever they return. So this is, you know, outsourcing fraud detection is, uh, is something that is really common as well. Um, and oh, yeah, just to get in the labels, I would, you, if you don't want to outsource your fraud detection, you, yeah, I don't know, you, you need to, you need to have someone to have a look at them. Otherwise you can, uh, start by not blocking any orders and wait to see, uh, which of those end up being fraud and start building a data set from them. But this is quite costly. This will cost a lot of money. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Unsupervised, yes. Uh, this is another way of doing that. You can, uh, you can, you can do clustering and figure out which of the behaviors are uh, more associated with fraud or non-fraud. Um, you might get into issues of having uh, because of the imbalance data. Uh, we're having very few examples, but uh, yeah, that's a, that's also a good a good idea. Any more questions? Oh, Walker, uh, you have a question. Yes, uh, I was just going to ask for the um, percentage of the data which is like um, unbalanced in most cases. It's always like that. Um, is it like uh, most of the transactions are not fraudulent or is it like the model is not detecting, for instance, the data that you should also have like 99% uh, 
not fraudulent, I have like 0.2% fraudulent. So it's like the data or the, we can, and, or that's just what the uh, data collection has been. Like most of the transaction has not been fraudulent and that's why we have less amounts of data for fraudulent activities. Um, so this is inherent from the data. Most people are not trying to take advantage of your, most people are not performing fraud. So the numbers will vary depending on the business, depending on your, on the company, but most transactions are actually fine. Uh, just some of them are a small amount of them are fraud, but, uh, even that small amount can cost a lot of money. Did, did that answer your question or? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Brenda, maybe I can ask you a question. Um, what what role does the fraud detection or the data science department play at Wayfair? And what sort of roles would somebody like one of our trainees, so fresh out of fresh out of university, has a good background, um, but doesn't necessarily have deep experience in the field? What sort of roles do uh, you see people on the team play? Um, I think maybe uh, the part of monitoring, uh, monitoring models, like because to to actually build the features, to actually build uh, the 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 actual model, you might need to get knowledge from the institution and knowledge from the domain. That might be uh, a bit more. You know that takes more time over time to get to know but i was i would imagine that um if you already have a system in place and you want to let's say compare the performance of the model uh just to monitor if it's uh if the performance is like changing over time and things like this that don't require like a long onboarding i think that would be a good application okay and so it's rather maintaining and monitoring as opposed to developing and deploying it directly? Um, I, I could also imagine like data validation would be a good one. Uh, so you have this feature, this is the expected value of them, is this fluctuating? Uh, is this mm -hmm. outside of this expected range? So okay. yeah. We think we have time for one last question. I, I can ask maybe if there is no other, I can give if there's another question, but so this, when you were talking about the fraud investigator, you reminded me a conversation that I had at the visa checkers in the airport. And it is really a lot of art there that you would just see someone coming and then they would just present you a visa to go somewhere and a lot of them come with a very you know complex scenario right and these people just usually rely on people's kind of inconsistency and like uh, uh, too much detail but do you see that because there would be a much more different because not here is a person who's coming and kind of giving you it's exactly the same thing it's, you know fraud except that the frauds in this case aren't digital and the data that you have is a lot more. So do you see any kind of gain one can have in mixing this data or so that's one and the other side is like, do you see that something that is used here, same algorithms probably applied there in that case, would it be just maybe a feature detection from a picture, a video feed um, or and stuff like that. So what is your, like beyond going from frauds and the digitally like the transaction, do you see there is some kind of um, information exchange or algorithm exchange that may that may apply in different frauds, different uh, topics or you know? Let me see if I understand. Like you mean com combining the data from like visa checking and fraud in 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 companies, or if the same system would work? in this different application is that your question yeah so it's like can you transfer knowledge mm. from one to another 
Hmm. Yeah, I would have to think. In pre my gut reaction would be that this is a very similar situation. Like you have some cases that are easy to spot and your model can learn, but other ones are much harder and you need humans to just uh, have a, another look at it. Uh, and bear in mind that even the humans who carry on make mistakes, right? Even yeah. these labels aren't per perfect. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Because I mean, the accuracy in the airport, I was told, I mean, it's really a lot. And I mean, in a way that the fraud that they, in a day, probably they would get, you know, a few, which is a lot, right? And they, yeah, it's kind of. So this is people faking a visa, basically, is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. Huh? And so it's a lot more, you know, it's like reward means like, you know, in not in 100% accuracy is not even possible even there um, with all the stuff. And however expert you become, at least you will make mistakes. So yeah. the being the investigator being, so it's not, it's even harder for humans. So is there maybe even probably sometimes what is harder for humans, maybe it's easier for machines. Um, so I don't know, just think, yeah, maybe think about it if there is any, any transfer learning one can do. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, I think we'll wrap up. Um, Brenda, thank you very much for the, yeah, for the, the insight on what you actually do. Great. Isn't that cool? Oh, sorry. We can't pretend that we're not sitting beside each other. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, Breda, thank you. Thank you for the insight. Um, I think there's a lot of content that you put in there. Um, I would actually like to understand a little bit more about it. But I think the practical, um, the practical and usable insights that you provide, I hope it was useful for the students. Uh, we appreciate your time. And we're looking forward to further engagements. Uh, yeah, further engagement with you and the team. Um, over to you if you want to say any closing words to wrap up. Yeah, cool. It was also a pleasure to to get to know the students. Um, I would love to be able to meet you in person. <laughs> um, and I can share this information and feel free to reach out. I can also give my, my contact if you want to ask about anything else. I can share the presentation with you as well. Sure. Um, and good luck on the challenge this week and uh, good luck on the entire training. And I hope to see many of you um, with jobs that you enjoy after that. All right. Thanks. Thanks so much. Brenda. Thank you. Uh, Yababel has something to add. Yeah, just bring um, maybe if you have time. So like I sent you just like a Jimmy link yeah, by email. So yeah.